to you about. I'm Martin. Uh, I'm from the HUD lab, and we're uh, part of the Center for Chemical Evolution. And uh, beyond that, we're in, I'm in the protopolypeptide theme. So like, I work with Aaron McKee, uh, who talked a little bit earlier. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about today is a problem in prebiotic chemistry. And, and I'm going to talk about how we are on how we think we're going to be able to explore a solution to this problem and some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, so as, as you heard in, uh, in the first talk today uh, by our Nobel laureate, uh, you can make biopolymers, okay? And so in this diagram here, what I have, I have uh, just general, any, any kind of monomer you want to imagine can be these. And biology today and nature as we know it, it will take these monomers and it will assemble them. It will stitch them together into some type of polymer. Okay, and so uh, importantly though is that what nature does is it stitches these in, uh, in a very specific order. Okay, and then once, once these monomers are stitched together in a specific order, then usually what happens is these are able to fold in some way or function in some catalytic way. So, you know, the example I have here is these, these monomers are all stitched together in a polymer, and here they are folded together, interacting with this cool little helix guy. You know, some interaction. You know, it could be, it could be anything. It could be binding, stabilizing interaction, for example. Uh, however, if we try to think about prebiotic chemistry and, you know, the early Earth billions of years ago, billions and billions of years ago, uh, we didn't have enzymes. So if you didn't have enzymes and, and if you didn't have templating mechanisms like a genetic coding system, then how could you have reliably produced a functional sequence over and over again that could have led to biology or biology-like processes? Um, so if we had a random pool of monomers on the prebiotic earth with no enzymes, nothing over this arrow, then if you had a way to stitch them together, if, if there was a good way to do it, what you'd end up with are a bunch of random sequence polymers. And that's, that's fine. However, once you make these, these random sequence polymers, if, unless you can disassemble these polymers, you can, you're going to use up most of your monomer material before you get to a useful sequence, before you get to a sequence that's able to say, have a stabilizing interaction with some other molecule. So really what you need in, in the absence of an enzyme or you know, a biological system is you need a reversible chemistry. So these, these monomers, if they're all just floating around together, if they can stitch together and form a bunch of different sequences, but then they can break apart and then re then restitch together in a different way. We can sample many different sequences from the same from the same pool of monomers. We can recycle them, uh, and so here what I've highlighted here is oh look this is the sequence that this this is that sequence from the last slide here, and so by by random chance you may be able to form it, um, and what's nice about this is that uh, this this idea is that you can you can reuse the monomers. And this, this has been a problem in particular for peptide chemistry on the prebiotic earth. Uh, but recently in the Center for Chemical Evolution, a lot of collaborators here have come up with a way that we think we can, we can get a system like this on the prebiotic earth. Okay, so you've probably seen this picture a hundred million times. That's uh, Stanley Miller's um, experiment, seminal experiment, where he showed that you can create uh, amino acids from simple, prebiotically plausible mixtures. And so everybody knows that. And as Aaron said earlier, um, and as is less popularly known, um, you can make amino acids in these mixtures, but you can also make hydroxy acids. So here on the left, there's an amino acid, right? And it has this um, uh, amine function. Uh, and then here is the hydroxyl group for the hydroxy acid. So in this presentation, they're always going to be blue or red. Blue amino acid, red hydroxy acid. And so you can make both of these in model prebiotic experiments. And furthermore, you can find these in meteorites. You can find these, uh, people, people have been you know, analyzing meteoritic uh, samples for many, many years now. And you can find lots of amino acids, lots of hydroxy acids. So we know that they were very abundant. So. Let's suppose that you only had amino acids because historically what scientists have done is they said, aha, we're going to take amino acids and we're going to try to make a peptide out of it. And that peptide will hopefully have some function. Well, the problem with that is that if you have 
a bunch of monomers, a bunch of amino acid monomers, it is difficult to get these to, uh, to stitch together. It's difficult to form a polymer from these amino acids. Usually it requires some kind of activation chemistry uh, in order to get polymers. And it's difficult to get long polymers. And it's generally thought that if you want a functional sequence, it's going to have to be a pretty long polymer. Think about how large a protein is, you know, thousands of amino acids. Uh, so if it's difficult to, you know, get three amino acids stitched together, then a thousand is unheard of. Um, but beyond that, uh, there, there's another problem, and Aaron uh, mentioned this as well. If you have two amino acids stitched together as a dimer, they will cyclize very easily, and this actually uh, will, will eat up a lot of the it will eat up a lot of the products that you would wish to go further along in the polymerization. Instead, they get stuck in this cyclic, uh, what's called a diketopiperazine trap. So, a couple years ago, in the center, uh, Center for Chemical Evolution. Uh, bunch of collaborators got together and said, aha, what if we mix together amino acid and hydroxy, amino and hydroxy acids together? And what if we uh, did like a prebiotic earth kind of simulation experiment if we had evaporative conditions? So if, if we had amino and hydroxy acids in solution together and we heated this up and we uh, basically boiled that water off uh, or let the water evaporate off, that's a better way of putting it, uh, then what will happen is when that water evaporates off, we're going to drive condensation reactions between these. And uh, because of an ester amide exchange mechanism that I won't really get into here, but Aaron, uh, Aaron mentioned it, what you end up forming are copolymers of the hydroxy and amino acids. And the, you can get copolymers of many different sequences and of many different lengths. Now, what's important here is that within this polymer, you're going to have the, the peptide bond, that's, that's, our, that's an amide, that's the one that we're used to seeing in biology, but you're also going to have an ester in there, and that becomes very important. Because the ester is way easier to break using, say, water, by adding water to this, than an amide. Uh, so, so we thought, okay, what, maybe we can explore uh, some of these molecules. So what we did was we cut down a little, bit of this, a little bit of the sequence space of these products. So we can form, you know, I only have three things here, but you can actually make many more sequences in many other uh, combinations and of, and of much greater lengths, you know, up to, I think, uh, 10, or 10 or 12 uh, amino and hydroxy acids in total. Um, and so what, what we do here is we say, okay, what if we started with this, with this hydroxy and amino acid dimer? Well, uh, if, if we start with that, then what you'll notice is on, the, on what would have been the N-terminus, there's a hydroxyl group here, and on the C-terminus, that's the carboxyl group, right? And if we put these, if we have these molecules, okay, and, and these are groups, these could be any side chain functionality. These are, these are you know, your standard amino acid side chains. Uh, and if we have these in a solution and we evaporate the water off, then the water, yeah, the water is evaporating off and we actually drive a condensation reaction between these monomers. And so what you end up with is they start stitching together using these esters. So here I have them kind of divided, like, look, we made, we put three of these together. But that's what's happening when we drive the water off. What's cool is that when you add the water back is that um, you can take these polymers and break them back apart into the monomeric units, or the starting units, the, the units that we began with. And it's kind of cool because many of the products of these, uh, of, of the reactions that I was talking about that uh, the guys in the center did a few years ago, they're, they're always a peptide that is capped with a hydroxy acid, and that allows for this chemistry. Now, if, if I can take this monomer, form a long polymer, and then break that polymer apart, that sounds exactly like what I mentioned in the beginning, doesn't it? We have a bunch of monomers, and we can form a bunch of random sequence polymers here. It's, it's very similar. Now, can we do better than that? Because remember, what we want to do is we want a very specific sequence. So like this guy here, I had it binding in, what, an RNA helix or something. So can we, can we do better than just random assembly? Um, and I believe that we can. Uh, so if we allow this, these reversible processes to occur, uh, if, if we let you know, the monomers form polymers and then back and forth, then if we were to add a molecule uh, or add something to, to our system, add something to our reaction that might stabilize one of these products, like this, for example, then 
what we would expect is that that product is more stable and therefore when I add the water back into the reaction, those aren't going to degrade. So we would expect the abundance of, say, this guy to increase in time while everything else kept breaking apart and reforming. And so that is, that's what we're investigating here. So I've got a little bit of change in notation here, uh, but basically what, what I want you to see here is that this little red and blue guy here, this is, say, the starting unit. And what, what we can do here is we can have these in solution and we can stitch them together by, by evaporating away the water. And in the presence of a, of a, uh, of a template molecule like a cation or you know, some, kind of, some kind of organic molecule, for example, then what we expect is that if something can bind to, say, that cation, it will be stabilized, or at least some of those molecules will be stabilized, and we will see their abundance increase, and it will kind of shift the equilibrium, the thermodynamic equilibrium of this system in their favor. And so that's, that's basically what we're working on, and if you want to talk to me more about it later, that's fine. Uh, I love talking about this stuff. And that's really all I've got for you guys. Uh, yeah, thank my lab, thank the Center for Chemical Evolution. Uh, any questions? What about amyloid forming peptides? They're short and they're self-select. You don't need to think about the ligand because a lot of metals will facilitate hydrolysis also. But if instead of choosing glycine, you take peptides that can form amyloid sequences, such as phenylalanine, you can have the selection of the surfaces of structures of sequences that have already useful structures yeah. just by selecting the sequence. Yeah, so actually we're considering uh, several things like that. Um, so if, yeah, if, if for example we had phenylalanine here uh, as this moiety, then and, and some charged moiety here for the, for the side chain here, what we would expect is kind of an amphiphilic uh, kind of layer formation. Yeah, we're, we're definitely looking into things like that because that would be a, that would be a very simple way to push the equilibrium in, yes. in a favorable direction. Let's thank, our, um, let's thank our speaker one more time.